Well, she's a multi-platinum selling artist, a multi-award winning artist, and she's a grand old Opry member. Also recently inducted not only into the Canadian Country Music Hall of Fame, but the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. Welcome to the studio. She's kind of a big deal. Happy to have on the record with Terry Clark. Good to see you. Oh, well, I'm going to need a bigger hat after that Is intro. <laughs> <laughs> we just saw your video for No Fear, and I, I couldn't help but think, Part of what you do, and, and for every artist, is it really a, a question of just being fearless and going for it? I think so. You know, it, it all starts out that way. You, you're a kid, and, it, and I think ignorance is bliss. When you're a kid, you have all that faith and that dream and that fire and ambition, and there's just nothing going to stand in your way. Mm. And uh, No Fear to Me is a song about that. It's a song about not letting people tell you you can't do it. Listen to the ones who tell you you can and that are going to support you and rally around you and help lift you up when you're feeling down. And, um, you know, it's a tough business and it takes sometimes a lot of years to make any traction at all to feel like you're actually getting any forward movement. So, yes, it's about being fearless. It's about mm -hmm. having that that determination and resilience to ad adverse events happening and saying, you know what, I'm not going to let this be a roadblock. I'm going to let it be a building block and I'm going to keep going. Boy, what a career you have had. We're talking about recording music for almost 30 years now, which is pretty incredible. She started out when she Suzanne. was two, by the way. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll answer that for you. But oh. I have to talk about the date, May 18th, 2023. Oh, my goodness. Induction into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. And, you know, you and I spoke and you said, you know, listen, this is a big deal. It's in Calgary. A, a lot of people here in the States will think of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and mm -hmm. it really is that equivalent. It is that big. And, boy, you had Jan Arden, one of your heroes, your peers, do the introduction. Talk about that night. Well, it was amazing. The whole thing felt so surreal to me, and, and it's truly humbling because there I am in the same city being inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame where I had years and years before lost a talent contest that everybody was making bets I was going to win, and I was heartbroken. I thought, I'm never going to make it in this business. For a nanosecond, I thought that. Mm, so you got you got to... You got to believe and have faith in a plan that maybe you don't have any control of. When you look at the Hall of Fame, and I go, I, I don't know, I, I'm assuming that you have not been back since all of this happened, but I, I think about those quiet moments when you look back and you see your name now alongside some of your heroes like Katie Lang and oh. Shania and Jan Arden, and the list goes on and on. You know, I, I, I looked at the list the minute I was told, well, Ashley McBride actually told me I was getting inducted when mm. we were backstage at the Opry one night. And, um, so I, I looked up, because I've always been so country focused, right? And mm. never thought in a million years I, I would be inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame because it was so broad, you know, in every genre. And I started looking at the, the names and it's like Gordon Lightfoot and Joni Mitchell <laughs> and Neil Young and Anne Murray. And I'm like, oh my God. And then, and then I noticed that, um, you know, it's not a ton of country artists that are in there. So the last one was Shania in 2011, which mm. um, blew me away. I'm so honored, and I'm, and I just feel um, I don't know. It, it it's uh, it's it's definitely uh, one of those moments where uh, you pinch yourself. It sounds very cliche to say that, but I I'm so grateful. I, I've been very very blessed, and if nothing else happens from this moment on, I, I feel like uh, you know all my dreams came true. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot left to do for you still, so. of course. Yeah. You know, your mom, I know, was such a hero for you. And I always said you're more like sisters than mother-daughter. Mm. What do you think she would have said that night? She had the best seat in the house that night. Mm, well I know said. she did. She was sitting with my grandparents on either side mm. of her. And um, it's going to make me cry talking about it. I, I, the only time I almost lost it during my acceptance speech is when I started to talk about my mom. And Jan introduced me, and she knew my mom. And she started to cry, too. I think we all felt my mom's presence in that room. She was such a big part of why I moved to Nashville. A lot of people in our family, including my grandparents, her parents, who were musicians as right. well, thought we were crazy. You know, what are you doing? Right. She's 18, you know, moving her 2,500 miles to a foreign country, not only a foreign country, but the Southern United States. It was a very different culture than, than I grew up in than I was used to. And we did it anyway, and uh, I, you know, she really believed in me, and she was my constant cheerleader uh, when I was in Canada, you know, making my way down here, and after and afterward, right up until she passed away in t 2010, mm -hmm. she was always 
always there by my side, and she's not there physically now, but she's still there. What was it like growing up in Medicine Hat, Alberta, and, and that young kid? Were you that rambunctious kid, and was music really an obsession for you? Because oh, your yeah. mom played some, and you said your grandparents mm -hmm. really were, were a duo, weren't they? They were. They played uh, in clubs in, around Montreal and in, in the club scene there when my, in the 60s, you know, before I was born, um, mostly. We moved to Medicine Hat when I was 11, and I spent all of my junior high and high school years there, very formative years, and mm -hmm. that's where I really immersed myself in country music and became a member of the Reba McIntyre fan club and, <laughs> and wrote letters to the Judds and mm -hmm. watched Ricky Skaggs' fingers playing guitar on TV and I was and, and knew all of the licks. Every lyric, everything. I was absolutely obsessed with it. So were there guitars just around the house for you to pick up and start playing and start singing? Were your family like, well, this is what our family does. It wasn't unusual. <laughs> My mom's guitar was a harmony and she, it was a 1948 and she got it from her parents when she was mm. a teenager. That was the only guitar in the house until she got me my first guitar because she would go to find her guitar and it was always in, in my bedroom. bedroom. So, <laughs> and now that guitar is hanging in my house. I still have her guitar, but mm -hmm. um, she got me my first guitar and then I upgraded to a Martin when I was 16. My dad got me a Martin D28 for my birthday and that's the guitar I played at Tootsie's Orchid Lounge after I moved to Nashville mm -hmm. and played for tips downtown and wrote better things to do on and all my early hits. So that one means a lot to me. But there, there was always a guitar around, mm -hmm. and my mom and I would sit in the kitchen and harmonize, and we'd sing together, and she would kind of coach me. She'd be like, oh, you're going a little sharp or a little flat here. She'd be making dinner and clanking dishes, and I'm singing, you know, everything under the sun. Patsy Cline, the Judds, Loretta Lynn, and uh, she would she would kind of be my, she was my coach, yeah, my mentor, say, really. Your, your education. Time. Yes. Yeah. We're going to talk about the drive literally to Nashville. A lot more with Terry Clark when we come back right here on The Record. Stay with us. Welcome back to you on the record here at our Music Row Studios, catching up with Terry Clark, our in-studio guest. And before the break, you were talking about making that drive to Nashville from Alberta. And of course, your mom got in the car with you and, you, and your family just thought you guys were crazy. They did. And, y you know, I had actually wound up in Ontario. It's a long story how that wound up. But I wound up uh, in Ontario, which is for those of you who don't know, just above Michigan um, instead of Alberta. And, and after high school, I kind of migrated east because it was closer to Nashville. It was a 12-hour drive as opposed mm -hmm. to a 36-hour drive. And so my mom and our uh, old family friend who knew me since I was a baby, the three of us got in Pat Murray's Honda Civic. <laughs> Pat Murray. Hey, Pat Murray. Oh, she's a riot, let me tell you. And uh, a character. And we drove south and we got to Nashville that night, very late. We left very early in the morning, got there late that night and, and holed up at a, a Motel 8 there off of Trinity Lane. And I could see the skyline from the hotel room mm. window. And I was just like, it was a very big city for a medicine hat girl to be looking at that she had to conquer all by her lonesome. My mother had to go back to Alberta because my brother was five. So they spent a week and a half with me, found a place to live. I got a, a job babysitting and in, in exchange for cheaper rent for a, a lady that worked shift work. So she had a three-year-old child that I babysat at night while she worked. Um, and then during the day, I'd go take the city bus down to Lower Broadway and play at Tootsie's Orchid Lounge for tips three days a week. And I didn't have a car. I didn't have a credit card. I didn't have a social security number. I, I did not have any way of getting a real job. So it was all kind of cash paying jobs. And you're 18. I'm 18. You're 18. In a foreign country. <laughs> In a whole other country. I wasn't going home to Alabama for Sunday dinner. That's right. Sure. I mean, yeah, you were here. You were locked. You were committed. Mm -hmm. What I didn't know, though, I mean, I, and you think about that early time. Now, here you are, right? Your mom sets you up. You get an apartment. You're ready to go. But they leave you. And I cannot imagine that goodbye. Mm -hmm. But walking up and down Broadway, how you locked in on Tootsies, because but people may not know, I don't know, was CD the right word back then? I mean, it was pretty different it, it, back then. I it, mean, it was sparse, a little bit more. You're yeah. being very kind. I am. I'm trying to be good. But I mean, now it's like... War zone, I think, is yeah. how it's been described. It, it really was rough back yeah, then in really those rough. days. And there, but there was club after club. How did you hone in on Tootsies? And what was that moment that you locked in that deal? Well, Tootsies is, is, is a historic landmark. It is, is, is a world-famous mm -hmm. honky-tonk. And it was frequented in the 60s and 70s by the Opry stars who would walk across the alley and perform at the Ryman Auditorium. 
And then they go to Tootsie's for a beer. Patsy Cline used to hang out there. Did you know that, though? Oh, that I knew point? all that. So you knew all that. Yes. You had your history. So yeah. I, I read all the history books. I, I was obsessed not just with the music, but with but the venues, the, the mm -hmm. venues, the history, like how it all happened. Nashville in particular, all of Nashville history. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I did all my homework in Medicine Hat. Instead of my actual homework, I was doing country music homework <laughs> and reading it all the books. It paid off. Right, exactly. <laughs> so uh, yeah. one of the things I really wanted to do with mom and Pat before they took off and left me there was go to Tootsie's. So I walked in and, and there was a guy singing. The place was empty. His name was Bo. And he was sitting on stage with just a guitar. And my mom and Pat were like, ask him if you can get up and sing. Come on. And I'm like, no. And they, they basically pushed me up there. And he said, sure. There was nobody there. The guy had been singing three hours. He was like, take the guitar. Gladly take a break. And then the door was open. So people started to fall mm -hmm. in. And by the time an hour or two went by, the place was full of people. And they offered me a job playing down there for tips. You were working on your on your songwriting as well, but how did you land your your record deal at that? Because you're you're working at Tootsie's, you're working in a boot street, a bookstore, uh, boot store that is. So you're taking yep. all these jobs. How did the deal? How did you want, did they find you or did, were you taking meetings? Well, there was a lot of uh, one thing leading to another. A guy named Brian Kennedy, who also Jerry Kennedy's son, who had produced a bunch of Reba McIntyre records, was a big guy at Mercury Records. Brian was in the music business, as was his brother, Shelby Kennedy. Uh, they became big believers. And Brian had a deal uh, with MCA Music Publishing to take a budget and take an artist of his choice in, basically, and record some music. So we did four or five tracks that were almost master quality on MCA Music's dime. And they he shopped me around and played that demo for a lot of people in town. Um, it eventually, it took a couple or three years later, wound up on Keith Stegall's desk, who was Alan Jackson's producer. He also produced Randy Travis's The Storms of Life records and, and some Big beyond players. that. Big right. player. And Keith heard something in that that he loved and and a super hardcore country traditional sound that he really loved. So I went and played live for Keith Stegall. I, I had also met a manager named Woody Bowles along the way mm -hmm. who was sort of, you know, uh, another big mm -hmm. cheerleader for me. One thing led to another and, and eventually I, I thought Keith had forgotten about me because he had a lot going on and a lot in the hopper. He was producing a lot of other artists. But one day my phone rings and Woody said, well, Keith Stegall just called me. And I said, oh, really? He hasn't forgotten because it had been probably eight, nine, ten months since I sat and played live for wow. Keith. Wow, so you're thinking this is not happening. I think it's not yeah. happening. He's moved on. Um, and and Woody said, Keith Stegall's just been uh, given the job as head of A&R at Mercury Records, and he wants you to come and sing for the president of the record label. No <laughs> pressure here. So I took my guitar in and sat down for Luke Lewis and Keith Stegall, and Woody and Luke and Keith and I are, were all in this in Luke's office, and I sang probably three or four songs. Um, if I Were You was one of those songs. I were you. I did not have better things to do or when Boy Meets mm. I didn't have any of those songs. So I sang a couple of songs I'd written, a couple of covers, and If I Were You, and they stood up, and I'll never forget Luke, just the biggest grin on his face, and he said, we'll, call, we'll be calling you. And I had been turned down already by every label in town at mm. that point. So when, when they called and offered me a real record deal, like a full-fledged album deal, I was beyond over the moon. I, I couldn't believe it was finally happening. And that was eight years after I'd moved to town. Eight years. Let's see how that, I did not know yeah. that. Wow, you talk about perseverance. It took a long time. For people at home that are watching and coming to Nashville and going, oh, I'll give it a year or so. Wow, that's not the case. And yeah. and you have to remember, like, this this was before social media. Mm -hmm. This was before American Idol. This was before cell phones. This was before the voice or any of any of these platforms that artists have now to expose their talent on a on a a bigger level. I mean, everything had to happen so organically and grassroots and, and, and it takes a long time. A lot of work. And yeah. boy, when it happened, it happened big. We're talking <laughs> triple platinum right out of the gate. We're going to have more. You want to stay with us right here on the record. We're talking with Terry Clark. Stay with us. Welcome back to you on the record here in our studios on Music Row, catching up with Terry Clark. And before the break, we were talking about the, the signing of your record deal. And I said, boy, when it finally happened, it happened big. It happened fast. Your debut album, Triple Platinum, right out of the gate, better things to do. Were you thinking, 
oh, is this, is this, is this easy? Well, I didn't know it was going to be like this. <laughs> As ready and prepared, it's, it's kind of like the climb. And you climb and you mm. climb and you climb. And then, and then you get, you reach that, that point in the mountain where you, you get something that you've been working for and you think you're going to be prepared and know what it's all about, but there's nothing that can prepare you really for that. that mm. That's, it was, it was, um, I don't want to overuse overused adjectives and and words, but it was surreal. Was it what I thought it would be? I, I don't know if it was what I thought it would be, but it was certainly exciting. And it yeah. was a blur. It, there was a lot that happened at once. And, you know, when I, when I see artists like Lainey Wilson and Ashley and people where everything's kind of happening at once, I just, I'll just be look at them and be like, <laughs> are you okay? Hold on. <laughs> is everything yeah. okay? Are you doing right. okay? A check. Because yeah. it is, it's, it's a whirlwind and there are a lot of demands and, where you were working so hard to just get one person to no notice you. Now everybody's asking for something at the same time mm. or wanting or requesting something or getting offers for every major tour. Right. When yesterday it seemed like you were playing for Tootsie, to, at Tootsie's Orchid Lounge. Moving for people tips. out of the doorway. Moving, Moving people, people out, out of the doorway. doorway. Now George Strait's wanting you to go on tour with him. And, and it, that, is quite a, that is quite a head trip when yeah. that happens. And, and, the, and the head trips kept happening. And yeah. the career kept blowing up. Ten years with the label and ten years into your career, you actually signed, of course, to become a member of the Grand Ole Opry. Not only that, then, and I'm fast-forwarding through, through your career, but getting to play with one of your heroes and recording with Reba McIntyre. And I want to talk about the two of you recently wrapping up a tour together and playing the stage of Madison Square Garden in just a bit. But you split your time between Nashville and Canada. And I know you can't take Canada out of the girl. And no. I know that's a big thing for you. <laughs> when you have some time, you're there and you're fishing. And I know you're going to be touring there. I thought we'd go ahead and play a song that really kind of sums you up. I would love that. Let's go ahead and do it. Terry Clark and Northern Girl. Here it is. Small town dreaming 
Carol by Terry Clark, and you can often find her doing a lot of things up <laughs> in her home country of Canada, doing a little fishing. You ever think about doing competition, by the way, for fishing competition? No, it takes the fun like out Because you seem like you just love it so much. <laughs> I do love it. I do love it. I don't know what it is that's so addicting. Um, mm -hmm. And people say, oh, it's so relaxing, isn't it? I said, no, it's not. Not when you're fishing <laughs> for, like, 14-pound fish. You know, it's interesting because I think you need that getaway because yeah. you hit it hard when you go, and you are going. Recently mm -hmm. wrapping up the tour with one of your heroes, Reba McIntyre, and you guys played Madison Square Garden. What was that like for you? It was amazing. I love Reba McIntyre more than I love peanut butter sandwiches. I just, <laughs> and that says a lot. I love her. She, she has taken me on tour now a third time. And I found this tour was a real gift for me. And Reba was just the class act and mm. so kind. Her whole band crew everything about it. We were like a big family. And, and she'll even say, best tour ever. <laughs> best tour I've ever done. And I'm just like, well, that that's amazing. And the Isaacs joined the second yes. leg of it, yeah. and they were great and just so talented. So it's, it was a, a wonderful experience and a, a real gift at this point in my career to play iconic venues like the Hollywood Bowl mm. and Madison Square Garden almost 30 years into it. The blood, sweat, the tears. Yeah, it doesn't get any better. I mean, you have worked your tail off, and be able to sit back and really enjoy these moments has to be amazing. The tours continue. You're going to be up in Canada touring with Paul Brandt. I know you have new music coming out. Can't say too much about it, but next year? Next year, I've, I've actually been in the studio recording uh, some music with some of country's new women and mm. uh, another guy who is not a country guy who I am a huge fan of. So... That is coming next year, and there will be more, more news on that as soon as I'm allowed to actually say more about it. But well, you know how they are. <laughs> you know how they are. Shh. Say the powers it. You make exactly. a big deal out of it. <laughs> we are looking forward to the new music. And like you look, Tariba, so many of the artists today now look at you that same way. And, boy, you have set up such a bar uh, uh, just a, a high standard to achieve. What kind of bar are you talking best. about? I'm talking about any kind of bar you want to settle <laughs> I got a up bar to. In my house. house. <laughs> <laughs> always a always blast starts. to hang out with always this girl. Start. Always, always a lot of fun. <laughs> Terry Clark, a pleasure to have you on the record. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having it. me, Suzanne. It's great to see you. Love this guy. Thank you.